OK, uh, so it's not easy to follow David, a very esteemed speaker. <laughs> uh, so my name is Kishore Atreya. I'm a product manager in Marvell, handling data center software, Sonic Inside. I am Pratyek Bhandarkar. I am also a director of uh, software product management at Marvell. Yeah. So today we're going to present an alternate approach to managing flows in an AI cluster. So when we, I want to be very clear. When we say alternate, we're not saying better. We're just saying different, right? So let's just skip right ahead. So uh, we'll give you a brief introduction to the AI training traffic background, like the fabrics, the stuff that David has probably already mentioned. Uh, the impact of job completion time, especially when it comes to congestion, other, other latency dynamics within the, within the fabric. Uh, some existing approaches to improve JCT, as well as our proposal and our call to action. So with that, I'll hand it over to my partner here. OK. so. Um, before we go into the solution uh, of what we are proposing, we wanted to kind of set a base uh, of the different AI models we have, different network architectures required. So if, if you see in, in this slide, so there were like typically the old generation ones where we, we had uh, small AI trainings, which, which could have been accommodated in just a single chassis with all the CPUs and, and the XPUs uh, required with all the PCIe links. And then we have uh, the next generation where the, our models uh, kind of expanded. We needed bigger uh, uh, clusters. So there we went into kind of the medium and large uh, AI training fabrics where, where you had uh, dedicated AI fabrics. It is only dedicated for AI training, and it is always made sure that you have only the AI workloads running on them. So it could have dedicated net networks, and it could have uh, uh, even uh, uh, j just proprietary networks. Uh, but what we are seeing there from there going ahead with a lot of uh, 2023 be becoming uh, Gen AI, more and more AI applications coming into the market, and more and more people integrating AI into their, their applications, we see that we need a multi-tenant fabric. Because every application today, every uh, software application, whether it is cloud or enterprise, they are looking at integrating AI into their, uh, their whole software suit. So what that means is we can't have a completely dedicated network just for AI. That is where the multi-tenant uh, aspect of the network comes in. We have to cater for different kinds of applications, different kinds of AI workloads, and even like even in the AI, the, the requirement for each AI applications are different. So what we need to make sure is that we cater for all of these, and every company doesn't have the, uh, the, the bandwidth to put dedicated AI networks because their LLMs might not be as huge as uh, typically what we have seen in a chat GPT AI. Right? So that is where multi-tenant net networks becomes more important. And with multi-tenant networks coming, becoming more important, what we are seeing is Ethernet becomes a default because you have different kinds of traffic, different kinds of requirements of applications. We see that Ethernet becomes more adaptable to these kind of networks instead of having a dedicated and proprietary solution into the AI networks. So when, when we think about AI, if you think how, how the AI workloads are placed, how they're interacting with each other, there are multiple steps goes, uh, goes even before it comes on to the server, right? So there are dedicated servers who are planning the whole AI orchestration, the work job orchestration. There is a mapper sitting on a server thinking, OK, I have this much workload which I have to work on, and I have this much, this much capacity on my CPUs and my GPUs. So where can I place them, and how do I interact to get all the results? And, and one of the key factors for that is job completion time. How can I get the job completed at the fastest time possible? So for all these things, actually the mapper has already mapped all the workloads, usually on your data center, uh, with very, very specific to the racks and the servers, everything mapped. So it, it has a complete view, and it will make sure that it knows the ideal state where it wants to be and how it can place its jobs on different uh, uh, infrastructure uh, products. So if, if you think of that, the training goes uh, in multiple stages. 
So we have the initial testing and pa uh, testing parameters. We provide all the inputs into the, the learning model. We get intermediate results. We work on them, uh, multiple iterations to kind of get into the final uh, trained model. All of this has a lot of east-west traffic. And all of these east-west traffic, if it is not planned, tends to have congestion on, on some of the resources because every result you're getting out of each training uh, step is going into one, one, one or the other resource which is kind of uh, concentrating all these results together. Right, so what happens there is, okay, we hit the congestion and we have to mitigate these congestion and plan ahead. So, so there are multiple ways uh, which, which is kind of uh, addressing all these congestion issues already. So it is like we have the packet spraying method, we have the VOQ method, we have the telemetry adaptive method. All of these are great in different scenarios. So one, one of the other alternative we are trying to propose today is because you have a mapper already, you have someone who is already looking into your network and your, all of your resources from a higher level, and it knows exactly where the job is going to be placed and how these jobs are going to interact, we are saying that it might be better or it, 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 is, it is a alternative approach to look at the network and the resources from a higher level. Don't just think from, from a network or a server or a GPU or XPU level, but take a look from, uh, from the top. And if you already know how you're interacting with each of these modules, then maybe it is better to configure upfront what the flows are. So, to go deeper into the, the whole uh, proposal itself, I'll hand it over to Kishore, who can take you into more details on this. Yeah. Thank you, Pratya. So like uh, Pratya mentioned, this is an alternative approach. <clears throat> As we claimed earlier, there is a mapping function that takes pieces of your workload and puts it, you know, maps it to certain compute elements in your network, in your, in your uh, infrastructure. So our approach is to kind of piggyback on that. So assuming that there is a controller or a mapper, there will be a way for us to pre-program the flows, uh, the traffic flows in the fabric from point A to point B. So that approach is something that we're calling a flow path routing or source routing. Uh, the idea is to assign the paths to the flows in advance before you actually start your workload, pre-program your fabric, right? Then we use the controller to prep the fabric, install all the routes and install the paths in, into your fabric as an initial step. Uh, there's a few advantages to this. Your controller can load balance your flows using source routes, assuming it has some information about your network. Uh, you can also tune it using telemetry. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, your fabric nodes, as defined in your fabric as the top or your, your leaf slash spine layer, do not really need to do a lookup, and we'll talk about how that we go about that. Uh, your destination ports can be embedded into your packet ahead of time, just like any old source route, similar to what you see in SRV6. And we'll talk about the difference about this proposal has versus SRV6 in a little bit. And we can eliminate lookup latency in your fabric. And, and the idea here is to use the information in your packet to immediately make the decision, kind of like a wire in your fabric node. So how does this new packet format look like and how is it embedded into a typical IP? Right, so on the left-hand side, you have your layer two header, your IP header, and your usual transport protocol of choice, whether it's UDP, TCP, Rocky, RDMA, it doesn't matter, right? Uh, in the middle, we are introducing a new shim, or what we're calling our flow path routing, routing header, in between the layer two and IP. And the reason why we put it here is we do not want to dictate new hardware implementations on the Mac. Just take advantage of what you already have, right? And we don't change the IP, we don't change the transport. And in fact, we don't use the IP or the transport at all as a part of the switching, switching decision making. On the right hand side, this is the header that we're defining. Uh, as you can see, there are five 16-bit fields, which we're calling hop IDs. Now your hop ID maps to a physical port number on your device. So this implies that your controller has to have intimate knowledge of not just your, uh, your fabric and your, what you're connecting to, but it also has to have an intimate knowledge of the actual switch itself and what physical ports map to your front panel. Right? So it's a little bit more involved work onto the controller, but it's something that we believe is achievable. Okay. 
Moving on to the control pipeline. So on the left-hand side in this diagram, you'll see a server connecting to, through a two-tier fabric to another server, sending traffic from point A to point B. Uh, we have defined roles for each ports in, the, in this fabric. One role is the access port, the other role is the fabric port. Your access port's responsibility is to perform a lookup of your flow, and your flow can be, your flow can be determined by an arbitrary set of fields. It's up to you, the one who defines the, the fabric. Right now, we're assuming source port, source port SIP, DIP, maybe QPair source and QPair destination in the case of Rocky. And the idea there is you do your flow lookup at the access. Once you resolve your flow lookup, you will have a source, source routed path where you'll know exactly what port to go out of in the first switch, what port to go out of the second switch, the third switch, and so on. Right. At the end of this process, you'll go ahead and encapsulate all that information to your packet and just directly switch it out the port that you want to go to. Now we go into the fabric layers. So when you're in the fabric, you come into a port that has a designated role of a fabric port. All you have to do in this switch is take the data from the packet itself, know that it's a physical port ID, and just directly switch it to that port, eliminating any lookup in your pipeline. So this, you don't have to do a layer two lookup, you don't have to do a layer three lookup, just take the information that's in the packet and just punt. That's the intention. As you go out of the fabric, all you have to do is effectively decap the FPR header. When you look at the hops count number, if it is zero, you're done. So you just remove the header and move on. So what are some benefits? So a few immediate benefits come to mind. The first is the paths are deterministic. The controller determines where to send, how to send, right? There is some reduced latency, and it's mainly due to the latency eliminated by the lookups, right? We're not claiming to, to solve, it's not rocket science. If you don't do a lookup, you don't have control, plane, control pipeline latency, right? So that will result in uh, some, some improvements to job completion time, although probably not super substantial. Uh, the other benefit, the ancillary benefit, is congestion can be viewed holistically versus in a single point. And we'll talk about that a little bit in the next bullet. So how does that work? If you have telemetry, you can use that telemetry to inform your controller of all the congestion events that you are seeing. The controller can use that congestion information holistically and determine how to rebalance packets during the jobs. Right. Uh, the central controller can retain that knowledge and you can also use it later on if you want to debug your fabric as you're tuning your process. So with that, uh, you know, we'll come to our call to action. There is a uh, HLD that we, are, uh, we have currently up in the side community. There's, it's located at this link. Uh, so please feel free to provide some feedback to us uh, and we're welcoming collaboration on this concept. Uh, we understand it's a little early and we you know, looking to the industry to come support us in this effort. Uh, some other steps and other areas for us to look at is, you know, as we mentioned earlier, there is a mapping function. If there are ways we can take advantage of what the mapping function does in AI and how it goes and maps flows in the, in the fabric itself, that's another area for collaboration for us. I think with that, we, are, we uh, can end our presentation. So that's a good question, and it's an open area for us. We're not necessarily looking to go to that level of scale of hundreds of thousands where failures are likely. But something will fail. Something will fail. Yeah, so we're hoping to utilize telemetry to get us more information proactively so we can either predict failures or take as fast actions as we possibly can. We understand that we're still in the early stages of this exploration, and we will learn more as we go. I'm not going to argue with you. Look at open flow, how it fails and why it fails, right? Mm -hmm. In MetaCave, there is fallback to UCP. In your case, 
Thank you. Go ahead. We're, we're in the process of collecting data. So it's, again, very early in the stage of this proposal, right? We, we, we need to uh, integrate with the mapper and make sure that uh, we, we get the data, so. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Okay.